My name is Abraham Hoffman, and I was named for my maternal grandfather. It was just shortened to Abe by the time I got to high school. Okay. Abraham was not just the only boy named Abraham in, in your class at school, but probably in the whole neighborhood, or for all I knew, all of Los Angeles. And the only other person I ever knew who was named Abraham was Lincoln, and my grandfather, who I never knew. So, yeah, you know, it just became a little more social, maybe, to be Abe. I just uh, don't believe in pulling rank very much, so Abe is a lot easier than Dr. Hoffman or mm. Professor Hoffman or anything like that. I was born in 1938 in the Lincoln Hospital at the corner of Brooklyn, not Brooklyn, what am I saying, uh, Fourth and Soto Street in Boyle Heights, Los Angeles. As far as I know, the hospital's still there. It's a small little hospital there. We, My family lived a, just about a half a block away, so. I guess my parents had it all arranged just to you know, zip over there, and that's where I came into the world. I had no idea that much of my life would be centered in that particular area because uh, Hollenbeck Junior High is about two blocks away from it, Roosevelt High about two blocks away. So you know, for about the first 18 years or so, I wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> Same general area. No, I never knew my grandparents. So. Uh, they were uh, my my mother's family was back east in New York, and uh, the joke was that we somehow was related to half of the people in Brooklyn. Although I never really got to know very many of them, and it wasn't until I was an adult that I actually did meet many of the uncles. I, my mother was one of seven, so uh, I didn't know the uncles or the aunts or the cousins, except for a very small number who did come out here. So I never really knew them. Uh, there's a photograph of me with my grandmother, but I was an infant. So then she went back to New York, and that was that. As far as my paternal grandparents are concerned, they were killed in the Holocaust. They never came to America. Where were they in, in Poland? In Poland. My parents had some interesting backgrounds. Uh, we have a photograph, and if you want to. Shoot a cot to shoot the photograph. We can certainly do that. I don't mind at all. But around 1925, my mother's parents and all of the members of the family assembled for a studio portrait, and it's really quite striking. Uh, there's seven children, and I guess the oldest four were married at that point, and then there's small children sitting on the on the carpet in front. And one of those, about four years old, is still around. He's about 85, and he's, he's into genealogy, and he had a great career and all of that. Uh, but my, mother, uh, my mother's father came to America about 1910, and he left his family behind. And it's one of those stories that you, you get from, it sounds so untypical until you realize probably how typical it was of so many people who came to America. And he came for a better life and found it and one by one started bringing the family over. And my mother and her two younger brothers and their mother couldn't come over once World War I started. And so they were separated for something like seven years and finally came over in 1920. And everybody got together again, and it was, must have been rather interesting. And of course, all this is told to me. I don't really know anything about it firsthand. Uh, but the youngest boy was only one, and here he comes to America, and he's like 10, meeting his father for literally the first time. So there must have been a lot of sacrifice and that sort of thing. My father had an adventure coming here. He was older than my mother and did not know my mother until he had come to America, but arrived in the same year where uh, after World War I, Poland became an independent nation, and they were drafting people in the Polish army. And it was a very anti-Semitic government. And he wanted no part of being in an army like that, and so he took off. And he had any number of adventures going to uh, across Europe, and got to Holland without papers, and then had to stay there for many months while his status was being regularized by the Dutch government, finally got 
a visa so you could come to the United States. And what I found interesting, my father liked to, to plant things, uh, secret things, I guess. And he, he passed away in 1987, and I still keep running into stuff that he just sort of squirreled away, like I'm, I gotta live to be 150 to find all this stuff. But it was rather interesting, he was hardly in America, not three months, when he wrote a huge letter to the Daily Forwards, which was the Yiddish newspaper, it covered two columns. It's a very long letter. And I said, oh boy, how am I going to figure this out? I don't read Yiddish. So somewhere else I was poking around, I found where he had translated it, like he knew I was going to get stuck on that, so he translated it. And it was a spirited defense of a halfway house where he had stayed in Amsterdam while waiting for his papers to be regularized because someone had criticized the place for exploiting immigrants and he's, he just wrote this tremendous defense that was nothing of the kind and it would have been all kinds of assistance to people and, and this is just a very short period of time after he came to America he's got a publication credit like that and not a letter but of this huge article I was very fascinated by it and I, one of these days I'll try and figure out something more to do with it. I made lots of copies. I don't want it to get, I want, you know, I've got nieces, nephews, my sons. I don't want them to lose track of the fact that uh, he had this kind of a contribution in immigration. But anyway, he came to America. He, his brother was here. And he uh, became an American citizen really quickly. He studied very hard and did some traveling, interestingly enough, back to Europe, went to Palestine for a visit with relatives who had gone there from Poland. And I never know what it, what they talked about. It would have been fascinating. Oh, came back, comes back to America, finally gets together with my mother, they get married, and goes into the business of manufacturing men's neckwear. I found this curious because it's the Great Depression, and they were doing well at it, especially in holiday season. And at Christmas of, what was it, about 1933, uh, gangsters came up and said he had to pay protection on his inventory and he refused to do it. The next thing he knew, the inventory was gone, stolen out of the warehouse. So he had to come out to California where his brother was and start all over, and that's why I'm here. Instead of New York or someplace, my mother's relatives never forgave him for kidnapping their daughter and bringing her 3,000 miles out here. Now we don't think about it pick up a cell phone, call somebody anywhere, but back then it was the other end of the world. But I grew up a native Californian because of that. What are your parents' names? My mother's name was Hilda, my father's name was Harry. Well, Hilda, what was her maiden name? Sophia. That was another interesting thing for anybody who's into genealogy. The family spells it S-O-F-I-A-N, but the immigration officials spelled it S-A-F. And that was really hard once we got the internet and you're going on ellisisland.org trying to track stuff down until somebody said you got to think a lot more flexibly on the spelling of people's names who come over uh, like that. And that's, so that was how I was able to find her, her uh, the passenger manifest. Uh, and her, there's her name, her mother's name, and her brother's name.